introduction and thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me to this meeting, which I happily accepted. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is what um, Alice already introduced. It's more about assessing animal welfare from concepts to legal measures. Of course, there have been many people working in this field, including our group, but also Elisabetta and many other groups in Europe, and I can't put everything in a nutshell in 30 minutes. So I will focus on certain aspects of welfare assessment. I will give you an overview on the basic concepts of welfare, how to define welfare, and how we can address these, these concepts in welfare assessment. And I hope for many questions then after, after my talk. Why on-farm welfare assessment? It, I think it has already been mentioned in, um, in the introductory spe speeches. At the individual farmer and the veterinarian level, there is an interest in welfare assessment for decision support on what to do on a certain farm in order to improve the situation, but also for monitoring if you do something, if you try to improve the situation, whether it actually changes. At the more larger level, there is producer group interest in terms of farm assurance. How well do a group of farmers in terms of welfare how is the strategic development of the industry, of the dairy cattle industry, or other types of, of cattle with regard to welfare? And what can we communicate to the public? Do we know enough about the welfare state of our farms and of our industry? And how can we communicate it? And last but not least, of course, there is consumer and societal interest in, in animal welfare and food quality, including animal welfare, food quality in a, in a larger sense, and also in the, in the context of sustainability concepts, becomes more and more important. And I'm convinced that animal welfare plays an important part in this context. And therefore, numbers of labels have, have popped up in recent years or have been truly established in, in many countries. So coming back to what um, Alice already presented, it's this concept of welfare improvement, and Becky Way called it the journey to welfare improvement. Welfare assessment is the starting point. We need to know what the situation is in a farm, whether there are problems, which kind of problems there are, and how to address them. And this is then already the identification of risk factors and the choice of intervention measures. And then the crucial point, whether they are actually implemented, what we recommend to farmers, and then we need to recheck whether we, whether we achieve improvement. And this is the classical management cycle. Check, analyze, plan, do, and recheck again. And so some people also call it, it's kind of a wishes cycle. You never get out of it. But if we want to achieve improvement, we have to follow this. Now, assessment is the first part, and it's an important part. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So my question to you is, how do you feel today? Good. Fine, good. Anybody miserable? <laughs> Terrible? No? Anybody? Yes, fantastic. Also not, OK. So what does this tell us? So what you actually do is you assess your own welfare. If you say, I feel fine, then you come up with an overall assessment of your welfare state. And this may range from miserable to fantastic. And now what you mentioned is quite good. There was no fantastic. But what I want to say here is that welfare is not a yes or no decision. It's on a, on a continuum from poor to good. And we judge, if we think about our own welfare state, we allocate us somewhere on this scale from poor to good. And now the majority of you said you're quite OK. You're in the green area of this scale. Now, my next question is, <coughs> what are your reasons for coming up with your judgment? Fine, good, fantastic. What do you take into account? <coughs> take into account when you come up with your own, when you're assessing your own welfare? Food. Yeah. Oh yeah. Food. The day of the week and the number of hours of sleeping. Okay. Numbers of hours sleeping, 
Food availability. Room temperature. Room, temperature. Room okay. Sunny day. Sunny day, okay. Is that good? Okay. Very good colleagues. For us, it's very good. Sorry? Good colleagues. Good colleagues. So basically, what you come up with is a range of different things that you integrate in your overall assessment. And this may range from the chair comfort. They are quite comfortable, I can tell you. So this is not a problem here. But it could also be your hunger level, whether you feel hungry or not, whether you're hot or cold, whether you feel hot or cold. You're about your social relationships, your job, your colleagues, whether you had a, an argument with your colleagues or maybe your partner this morning at breakfast and you're happy to have escaped from it, and so on. And also your health state. Nobody mentioned the health state, but I think it's also an important thing to consider. And this makes up the overall assessment. But what the main message is, it's very different aspects that, that are taken into account and it's independent aspects. The chair comfort has nothing to do with your hunger level. So you can be perfectly, um, you are not hungry at all, you had a nice breakfast, but the chair is terribly uncomfortable. And this is two different, completely different independent aspects. And the same is true for social relationships and for the health state. So we have different independent aspects of welfare when we judge our own welfare. And this now needs to be translated into cattle welfare. What are these different aspects and how can we assess them? And that's the, the big question here. And there are three main concepts of animal welfare that are always brought up in this discussion and that are I would say in the scientific community are well accepted. And the one is the, the concept of biological functioning, as long as the bodily functions are okay, as long as the organ systems work well, as long as there, as there is no change in the tissues or in the homeostasis in the body, then, then the welfare is okay. So that's one point of view. And this relates mainly to fitness in a general term, but in terms of uh, more veterinary um, topics, you could say that already with subclinical disorders there is an impaired welfare. If you have an elevated cell count in the milk as an indication of something going on in the, in the other, this is already an indication of an altered biological function, function of the other and this may already indicate impaired welfare. Then another important aspect is the mental state. So the psychological dimension of welfare, and this includes emotions, emotional states, affective states, such as fear, anxiety, apathy, but also, these are all negative emotions, but also positive things such as joy, feeling happy, and this is now increasingly acknowledged that animals are obviously also able to experience positive emotions. And of course there's an overlap between these two areas, especially with regard to the negative emotions. If you think of severe lesions of clinical diseases, they are often linked with apathy, with pain, and this, is, this relates to the mental states of the animals. But of course, in a cow with such a claw lesion also has a reduced biological function because there is a tissue lesion in the claw, in the claw horn, and so there is this overlap and it's not completely separate. The last um, dimension I would like to mention is the one of naturalness, and this mainly relates to the ability of animals to perform the normal behavior repertoire, but also it relates to aspects such as integrity, and here I, I refer to to mutilations which you do on the animals, the horning animals, uh, in other species it would be also castration, um, uh, tail docking in, in pigs and so on, and this might also be subsumed under this term naturalness. And there are scientific reasons to include this aspect of naturalness in animal welfare, but there's also one important aspect, this is the first thing which comes into mind in the con from the consumer's point of view, when talking about welfare. Consumers would like to see happy cows on the grass. This is often what they often mention, and under blue sky and so on. So this aspect is important, and since welfare is not a purely biological concept, but also a societal concept, we should be aware of these aspects.
Now the question is, how can we address all these issues? And the main message is, measure all aspects, try to include all these dimensions if we want to have a comprehensive overview of welfare, but do not measure everything which is possible. But be selective in doing what you are doing. And the question is how? For a long time there was a welfare assessment, so-called welfare assessment, mainly related to the so-called indirect parameters. By describing the housing environment, by describing the management, and maybe even taking into account some genetic, genetic um, predisposition into account. And the question is, can we properly, truly assess welfare by just using this information on the dimensions? Okay, if the cow has 7.5 square meters available, then she's perfectly happy. If the farmer is well educated, that's that tells you that the, that the cows are happy. That's quite questionable, but that's a way which for a long time welfare has been assessed by just looking at these resource-based measures. But just to give you an, the, the other hand is, on the other hand, we have direct indicators of welfare which relate to health measures, to behavioral measures, or to physiological measures. And just to give you an indication of a study which we did in um, in, in Austria, 35 cubital loose uh, herds in, in cubital housing, very similar farms, very comparable farms, with comparable herd size, comparable housing system. Also, the age of the farmer was even quite comparable, the educational level. But looking at some outcome measures like lean animals, with animals with poor body condition, lame animals, animals with hog lesions, with mastitis, or the incidence of agonistic interactions. On the one hand, quite disturbing figures, I would say, 40% lame cows on average on these farms, which is not, which does not speak for a high welfare state. But what is more impressive is the huge variation we find between, between farms and Alice went to 150 farms, or she worked with data from 150 farms, and she um, experienced the same thing, that there is a huge variation between farms. And this is due to this interaction between housing, management, and other factors, so that we cannot tell just from these factors. They merely describe the potential for achieving welfare, but the direct parameters are the ones if you want to do a valid assessment. And such assessment systems have been brought up, comprehensive multidimensional protocols, which mainly rely on animal-based measures, on these outcome measures, have been developed. And one, they have already been, been um, shown, is on the one hand the welfare quality protocol, uh, the welfare quality project, where I was also involved in it, Elisabetta and others, from, from colleagues from, from Padua. And, um, and then the follow-up project was then the animal welfare indicators where we were not involved, but Elisabetta again was. So these, these protocols are comprehensive. They try to cover all these different dimensions of welfare. And I want to show some examples of these measures. Uh, going back to the welfare quality system, the basic idea is that welfare is make, uh, made up out of four principles, good housing, good health, profit behavior, and good feeding. And then different criteria have been defined in order to cover all these different dimensions of welfare, like thermal comfort, comfort around resting, or ease of movement, describing the good housing, and so on, and so on. And this was this attempt to, to cover all these different measures. Now, what has been covered? Regarding the biological functioning, we should look at the production diseases, especially for dairy cattle, this is one of the, this is the major welfare problems with regard to health disorders, lameness, subclinical or clinical mastitis, metabolic disorders, and as a more indirect measure, also the body condition. These are measures of the biological functioning, and just to give you an example of lameness, as I have shown you, on average between 30 and 40 percent of the cows are often found to be lame, so it's a huge problem. And it's not just the, the <coughs> slightly lame animals as the cow you see here, but also the more severe ones, 
And for example, the, the Welfare Quality Protocol distinguishes in sound animals slightly lame and severely lame ones. And we know that lameness is highly, is lameness prevalence is a highly valid indicator of welfare. Pain is the very likely cause of lameness <coughs> because it hurts when they put weight on the, on the claw. They show this altered gait, the modification of the gait. We also know that lame cows <coughs> show impaired mobility and they have uh, less well access to resources and it's also associated with lower milk yield, with lower fertility and also lower longevity. Lame animals have a higher risk to be culled or not to survive in exploitation. And as I've said, there's a huge body of evidence that lameness is a huge problem and it should be addressed and therefore it should always be included in such an assessment system. But there are, of course, more health indicators or health-related indicators which should be included or which can be included in assessment protocols. On the one hand, they may relate to other clinical diseases such as respiratory disorders, such as vulvar discharge, <coughs> indicating endometritis and so on. But a very important one is also the alterations of the integument, skin alterations such as um, hog lesions, swellings of the hogs, which may range from hairless spots to more severe um, lesions where we have broken skin or alteration of the skin. And from recent um, study, from recent study which we have done, um, we can also show that already hairless. This is the pain. This the graph shows the the level of painfulness or how much force has to be. Um, has to be introduced on the skin, on the hair, on the lesion, until the, the animals withdraw from, from this stimulus. And so the higher the score, the less painful it is. And in the control animals, it is like this. And already with hairless spots, which don't seem to be a, a severe alteration, we can also already see that the pain, that there is some increased pain sensitivity, and this is significantly increase in the lesions where there is broken skin and so on. So, but already hairless spots are obviously relevant for the animals in terms of welfare, in terms of hypergesia in these lesions. Other measures which can also be included is cleanliness, but also of course mortality, or the reasons of involuntary cullings, fertility and longevity, just to give you an idea. Now with regard to naturalness, that's already a bit trickier. Um, Alice uh, spoke about time budgets, how, how animals spend their day, how long they want to lie down and how long they want to feed, and therefore information on the time budgets, on how animals spend their, their day would be highly interesting, but of course this is a bit trickier to get this information. But nevertheless, it's a valid information. And we know that there is a high there are high priority behaviors such as lying down, such as feeding and rumination. And from, from other studies we know that heifers, at least heifers, but we can, I think, extrapolate it also to adult cows, they show an inelastic demand for rest of about 12 to 13 hours per day. If you go on farms and if you measure actual lying times, they're often much lower. They're often around 10 or 11 hours, so this is definitely less then animals want to lie down, and maybe they don't want to lie down for 14 or 16 hours, but we should achieve this, this, um, this lying behavior. They also show a relative priority for lying. When, they, when the access to resources is limited, this was a quite neat study, where the animals were able to lie down for 23 hours, for only 15 hours, over 12 hours. And the, oops, sorry. And the orange bars show the actual, on the one hand, the absolute amount of time they spent lying down, but the bars show the relative proportion. So when the, when the availability of lying down is less, or the, the possibility to lie down is less, then they spend relatively more time lying down. And they shifted away from feeding, and they especially shifted away from doing other things. And therefore, and also we know that low lying times are, they are at least assumed to be linked with production diseases such as lameness or even with, uh, also with, with other diseases. 
So this information on these behaviors would be very nice, but I agree that it's difficult to, um, to obtain this information. But there are other normal behaviors which are unwanted, and this would, for example, relate to agonistic interactions, aggressive interactions between animals, which tells us something about the social climate in a herd, in a group of animals. And therefore, a measure which is, has been included in welfare quality is the incidence of agonistic interactions as an indication of unstable social relations, of impaired access to resources, of a lot of competition for resources, but also as an indirect measure for the risk of injuries. And for example, in the welfare quality protocol, this behavior is observed for two hours. So this is not very much time for behavior observations, but in terms of assessment protocols, it eats up a lot of time. So it means quite a lot of effort to actually observe for two hours the animals. It's highly interesting, it gives you a lot of information, but it's time consuming. <coughs> and we may also look at other unwanted behaviors, uh, which are more linked to disturbed or um, abnormal behaviors, such as stereotypies, or altered sequences of behaviors. We have already seen the horse-like rising of, of cattle. We can also look at the, at the lying down sequences and how long it takes, if, it takes a, if the lying down sequence is very prolonged. This is an <coughs> indication that the, the comfort of the lying area is not sufficient. And um, this um, tongue rolling or tongue um, of, of cattle may indicate as a stereotypy may indicate deficiencies in the, in the feed composition and so on. Now the trickiest part of the story is how to assess the mental state of animals, but it's also a highly interesting one. And with mental state, what do we mean here? <coughs> Looking at emotions, it's not so, not so easy. We have to, um, to take into account that there are two dimensions which have to be considered. On the one hand, the first dimension I would like to mention is the one of arousal. So, and this might be reflected, for example, by heart rate. <coughs> so a higher heart rate <coughs> indicates a high arousal of an animal. High level of movement indicates a high arousal of an animal. But this does not necessarily tell whether this arousal is positive or negative. We need to include an, another dimension which is called valence and which may be negative or positive. So you can have a high arousal, a high level of movement, a high um, level of heart rate. And on the one hand, it may indicate that the animal is actually quite excited and happy. It may be playing, it may be playful. Then also the heart rate goes up and it's highly active. But it may also indicate that it's anxious or fearful. <coughs> And it can also be trying to escape from you. That means it's highly active. And it may also have a high heart rate because it's just anxious. So we don't have easy measures for, for these different, um, different emotional states. But we have some ideas of, of how to address this. One thing which is also related to, um, to the emotional state is, is assessing the human-animal relationship. We have heard that this is important, an important aspect, and <coughs> poor human-animal relationship results in reduced milk yield, <coughs> and impaired milk letdown, chronic and acute, acute stress responses, but also it may contribute to traumatic incidents and therefore increase the risk of injuries. So how can we assess this? There are quite simple avoidance tests um, which can be used to, to assess the human-animal relationship this is just two pictures of, in, in a tie stall, um, the, the test person starts at a distance of about two meters and then slowly approaches the animal. And the distance between the hand of the test person and the, and the head of the cow is estimated when the cow shows an avoidance reaction. And the proportion of animals that, for example, allow to be touched, that can be touched, or the proportion of animals which, have, which show a high um, avoidance distance is an indication of the quality of the human-animal relationship in the herd. I have also a video. Can you maybe start it? Uh, yeah, okay. Just, just this is in a loose house. 
one of my former PhD students. She slowly approaches the animals. This cow even approaches her after being touched. To be honest, this is the family farm of this PhD student, and the cows are very nice girls, and they are all allowed to be touched. No avoidance reaction. That's the situation how we would like to have it in most farms, actually. But this is an easy test which can be quickly done, which do not, does not take much time, and which gives valid results. What other indicators do we have? Um, also with regard to positive emotional states, which is, as I said, also an important aspect. One of the promising candidates is play behavior. We know that play behavior is shown as a rewarding activity. It only occurs under favorable conditions if the animals have eaten, if they're not hungry, if they're healthy. So it's always connected, more or less, to, to positive, to good conditions. And we also know that it's reduced when the animals are in pain or, for example, following disbodying, following dehorning. And it's highly motivated, as has been shown for, for calves in, um, in, in, in the Danish study here. And you may ask, do adult cows play? Yes, they do. Yeah, weiter so. Okay, so I have to tell you what you are supposed to see. It's two adult cows highly jumping around, tail up, and just excited about the fresh straw that has been added, and they're just jumping around. So adult cows do play if they have the opportunity, and if they get new things to explore. And so if they're always kept in the same barren environment, they do not play, of course. But if they have the opportunity, so I think it's a good indicator but the problem is, again, you have to spend quite a lot of time in order to, to catch it and in order to assess it. Another promising indicator is social licking, which has often been proposed as a positive indicator of welfare, but it's not so easy. It's expected to be associated with positive feelings, and that's also how it was presented. We know it from very stable herds, from herds like the beef cattle herds that always stay together in very stable social relationships. And so the hypothesis would be cattle in herds which show a high level of, of social licking are better off. They feel better than herds with less social licking. But in dairy herds, I have my doubts that this is really true. In many cases, it may just alleviate poor welfare. It may just be an attempt to reduce social tension. If there's a lot of aggressions going on, we know that there is also, this is often followed by social licking. Then it's not necessarily a purely positive thing. And it just reduces social tension. Of course, you could say this is also positive, but it's not a clear indicator of an overall positive state. And again, we also know that in Thai stalls, more social licking is shown than in loose housing. And this just may this does not necessarily mean that welfare is better in Thai stalls. It may be just due to boredom or to oral understimulation and that they are motivated to show this behavior. So it's not so clear cut. <coughs> the last measure I would like to present is the qualitative behavior assessment. I can't go into details here, but in a nutshell, qualitative behavior assessment <coughs> means that trained assessors learn to interpret the body language of animals which is supposed to, by using qualitative terms such as tense, relaxed, bored, what else, um, curious, inquisitive, uh, such qualitative terms, and the behavior of a group is described, the expressive quality of the behavior is described by such terms, and this is supposed to reflect the emotional state or the affective state of, of the animal. To be honest, this has not been really, or it has been um, validated to a certain extent only. There are some quite promising validation studies, but not in cattle or in other species. But there is now one also in horses, which is quite promising, so that it's actually linked, what is picked up by observers, linked to the actual emotional state. And therefore, I would say it's a promising measure, but we need more work on this. Now, just to sum up, 
how do assessment protocols in practice look like? They mo mostly focus on health aspects. Um, why is this the case? I think the level of comprehensiveness of, the, of these protocols, how many different dimensions of welfare they cover, depends on the one hand on the purpose, but mostly it depends on the availability of resources. So on the purpose on the one hand, if you want to identify poor welfare farms, you, may, you, may, you do not necessarily have to look at all measures of positive welfare then it might just be enough to look at the, more, the most welfare problems, the most relevant welfare problems. Then it might be enough to look at mastitis, hock lesions and lameness, and you will probably pick up the worst farms. And then you can have a quite reduced protocol. Um, if you want to do labeling, and if you want to put a label on your milk package and say, this is from, from true welfare farms, then I would expect as a consumer that you cover many different aspects of welfare and that you do not focus only on clinical health measures. And then the, comp the protocol needs to be more comprehensive and need to include more measures. And then the most pressing argument is always time needed to record all this thing. The welfare quality protocol takes about six to eight hours per farm, per average farm of up to 100, 150 cows. This is, of course, quite a lot of time which needs to be spent in these farms, and that's the reason why it's often cut down to more short term, to protocols which are applicable in much less time. One example is the Sure Well protocol. The Sure Well is also a follow up um, pro project in the UK which covered many different species and, um, and categories of the different species. And just to give you an indication what's in the Assure Well protocol for dairy cattle, this is all the yellow ones more refer to health and biological functioning. And the two ones here, like response to sub person and cows needing further, step, further care, they are more linked to the mental state. There's nothing on natural behavior or normal behavior or even on abnormal behavior. Um, so it's a clear focus on clinical indicators. And this is now being used um, in for the RSPCA Assured label. This is a conventional farming program, but with a high welfare claim. And also the Soil Association, which is the largest um, organic farming association in the UK. And all the farms are, are being um, inspected using this uh, welfare assessment protocol. Now, my conclusions are, as I already said in the beginning, measure all aspects, but do not measure everything. The choice of measures depends on the intended use and on the resources available. I would also call for more comprehensive, um, comprehensive protocols, especially if the claim is that you cover properly the overall welfare state of the animals. And if you have a more smaller, tinier protocol which reflects mostly <coughs> clinical measures, then the label should be honest enough to clearly indicate that it's only covering <coughs> health measures and not the other aspects of welfare. So they should relate to what has actually been covered in the assessment protocol. And I'm now happy to answer your questions and thank you very much. <coughs>